Would you raise your hand? We just want to make sure that we get these in your hand today. Uh, God's Word is rich, and sometimes you can't get all of it in just sitting here thinking about it and remember everything that was spoken to you, so it's good to write it down, be able to take that home, meditate on it, and, uh, and be able to share it with someone else, so we use message notes. So go ahead and keep your hand up. Our ushers and greeters will get those into your hand this morning. Before we get into the Word, let us pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, we are so excited to be here in your presence today. We're thankful, Lord, to be able to come into this place to give you honor and to hear from you. And Lord, that is exactly what we want. We want to be able to hear from you directly today. Father, we did not come to hear from man. We came to hear from the very Spirit of God. So Lord, lead us and guide us into all truth. As we open your word, would you explain it to us? Would you teach us, Lord God? Would you grant us revelation that goes beyond just the head knowledge, but one that brings a conviction to the heart and a change of life and transformation? This is our desire today, Father. I offer myself as a vessel for your use, Lord. I empty myself as best as I can. Will you do the rest and take over and speak only your truth? Let not one false word proceed out of my lips. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we are are back in the book of Matthew. We have been, we've been talking on different subjects and everything, but one of my favorite ways to, to go through the scripture is called uh, expository. Everybody say, say expository. expository. Anybody know what expository means? Mm-hmm. It means it, it exposed. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah that, <laughs> Jackson was like exposed. That's basically what it is. We are exposing the true intent of what God said by going line by line. So instead of doing something topical and we just look at one particular scripture, we look at all the scriptures in that section so we get a full understanding of what God is saying. And uh, it, it avoids misinterpretation. That's one of the reasons I, I love expository teaching. We've been going through the book of Matthew, and we, we started uh, a few months ago. But, uh, you know, we like taking our time and going through the Word. And as the Lord leads, we, we move and shift and change. But we are in Matthew chapter 6 now. Matthew chapter 6. Let me do a, a brief recap of what we've seen so far in the purpose of the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew was written by Matthew, who is uh, uh, one of the uh, apostles, and his purpose in writing this book was to speak specifically to the Jews. He was written specifically to the Jews, and in this gospel, he was laying out his, his reasons for why he knew Jesus Christ is the, the coming Messiah. So a lot of times throughout this, you'll see him reference as it is written. He said, and Jesus is this, just as it was written in the prophets, or just as it was written in this time, just as God said. He says that several times because he's giving evidence to them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that they had been waiting for. So at this point, we are now in uh, what is called the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first time that Jesus preaches to the multitudes. And the manner and fashion in which he does it is really interesting. See, when, when Moses came, first of all, let me tell you this. It was prophesied that by Moses that would be one, a prophet would come just like him. And what he was talking about was he was talking about the Messiah, that the Messiah would come and be like him. So Moses, you know, he got the revelation from God. He got uh, the commandments of God. He went up on the mountain and received them. And then he brought them down to the people. And it was his responsibility to deliver them. What's interesting about how Jesus first preaches is that he, remember, just came down off of the Mount of Temptation. Satan had tempted him, and the Lord rebuked him using the Word of God, and then it says that he came down in the Spirit and power of God. So now, Jesus comes down, and he's doing miracles and signs and wonders. And now, the multitudes begin to follow him. So he says he goes up on a hill, and he sits down, and he begins to teach. And when he sat down and began to teach, when, when, when the teacher sits down, it commands attention. It's like, he's about to say something serious. So Jesus, this is his first time preaching. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts laying out, in a, in a very orderly fashion, his commands. Just as Moses came and laid down God's commands when he came to them, Jesus now comes and he's laying out his commands. And he says some very interesting things. In, in Matthew chapter 5, if you recall, he lays out uh, some, some standards that don't trump the law, he actually raises the standard and says, now you've heard that it was said that if you, if you murder someone, then that's wrong. He says, if you hate your brother in your heart, 
you've already committed murder. So he, now he says, it's not just what you do, but it's what you feel and think in your heart. And everybody's just standing back like, wait a minute, you just upped the game. Jesus is like, yeah, I did. I just upped the game. So it's not enough just to not kill somebody. He said, you can't want to in your heart. You can't hate them in your heart. You're like, oh, man, at least let me sit there and imagine me taking this person out. No, he doesn't even want you to do that. So he's raised this standard for us. And it has to do with the heart. That is, that is the primary message in the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus begins dealing with people's hearts. See, the law tried to deal with people's actions. It was simply behavioral correction. But Jesus is taking it to another level. He's like, I'm not talking about your behavior. I want to get down to the root issue, and that is your heart. I want to deal with your heart. So this is, this is the context that Jesus is presenting this in. So today in Matthew chapter 6, I want to speak to you on the, on the topic of motives, masters, and money. Motives, masters, and money. This is the context of Matthew chapter 6 here. So let's just begin to read, uh, read at Matthew 6, verse 1. It says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in, in heaven. All right. Let's stop right there for a second. He begins dealing with the heart. He says, don't do your charitable deeds in front of men. Don't do that. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. That's a pretty bold statement. All of Jesus is, I love Jesus. All of his statements are just clean, cut, black, white, dry. Don't do these things in front of men, because if you do, you have no reward from God. Dang. Let's keep going. Just let that soak in for a second. Verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites. Everybody say hypocrites. Hypocrite. All right. When Jesus starts using the same word over and over, it's something we should pay attention to. So listen to how many times he uses this word in this section here. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Wow, he just called out the priests and everybody right then. He's like, those dudes right there, don't do what they do. People are like, oh, Jesus, that's not very nice. He's like, I didn't come here to be nice. I came to tell you the truth. Don't do as those who in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. You got your reward. You wanted everybody to think you're, you're special. So you go out there, you do all these things, you sound the trumpet, hey, everybody, look what I did. Look at me, look how good I am. Okay, good, you got your reward. You got the blessings of man. You traded in and exchanged the blessings of God for the blessings of man. So you got your, you got your reward. Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't do that. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be done, may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. He's saying, look, don't go out there and do good deeds and then blast it all over the place. I mean, Facebook is a wonderful tool, but it's also one of the great, great like, uh, tools of the enemy also. I'm like, look, you did a great thing. Why do you got to blast it out there and say, hey, everybody, look what I did. I did all these things. Woohoo! I got 125 likes on that one. Good, there's your reward. You got 125 likes. You got 125 people saying, Good job. I want, I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, when you, when you blast all that stuff out there on Facebook, you're just looking for the attention of man. And what it does is it reveals a condition of the heart. It reveals who you're really trying to please. If you're really trying to please God, just do it in secret because he sees. He, he doesn't need Facebook to know what you're doing. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need you to post the details and everything. He's got it. So if you're doing that, it's because, look, everybody, I want you to see me. And listen, I understand why we do those things. There is something in us as human beings. We want to be loved and we want to be valued. We all have that. We want, we want that love and attention 
and that value to let us know that we're worth something to somebody. We need that. And sometimes we will do things to try and get that for ourselves. We need this attention. We need this affirmation for ourselves. And, and it's okay to desire that. But we need to know, understand first and foremost where it comes from. Your value and your validation does not come from man. It can only come from God. He is the one who created you. He's the one. Anybody got some cash on them? Somebody, give me a, a 10, a 5, a 20, anything like that. I'm taking up an offering right now. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. And one dollar, okay, okay, we got a, we got a, we got a 20 right here. We got a 20 right here. All right, this is... A piece of paper, remind me where, I, I'm getting it right back to you. I'm like, thank you. May you be doubly blessed. <laughs> Overflow into your life. All right. This is <laughs> so bad. <laughs> we got a green piece of paper with a picture of a dead president on it. It's got some features on it so you know that it's real and it's not fake. And with this, you can take this into a store somewhere, and you can buy something. You can go get, you can still get a ticket for the movies with this, praise God. Sometimes, in some places. <laughs> That's about it. You can put some gas in your car. You can, do some, you can do some stuff. But it's a piece of paper. I've, I've got a piece of paper right here. Okay. Good. You got a piece of paper. This one has some ink on it and it has some writing. Can I go take this piece of paper and go get some gas with it? It's the both paper. This one's got ink on it. This one's got ink on it. This one's even bigger. Look at that. Why? Why can't I? Why does, why does this have no value and this have great value? Be, who, who said so? The world? Actually, yeah, it's the world. It's the United States of America. The government. The government says this has value. Therefore, everybody honors and respects it. Well, guess what? I say this has value. This is just as good as that, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, be blessed, brother. <laughs> be filled. As a matter of fact, that's got double the value on that. We'll get you something nice, something real nice for you and your family. Be blessed. Have that. Now, was that offering that I just gave to Nate really worth anything? Why? I don't have any authority to establish the value. The government has the uh, authority to establish the value on that paper. Guess what? God is the only one who has the authority to establish your value. Even if somebody else is praising and all that stuff, it means nothing. I can say that paper is worth something all I want. It means nothing unless there's somebody who has authority to establish that. Guess what? You've been established. If you, if you didn't know, just the fact that God himself saw fit to come down and die for you personally. Not just everyone, you personally. He saw your face on that cross when he died and he established your value and he said, it is worth it for God himself to die for you. What greater value is there than that? You don't need to be looking for this from everyone else. He's already said it. Period. Done. Written in heaven and established. Now that does have some value to me. I'm going to need that later on. So let me get that back, brother. Thank you. This has, this has some personal value to me. So we need to understand that. He continues on in verse 5. Remember, he's talking about hypocrisy. Verse 5, he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Everybody say hypocrites. hypocrites. There he goes using it again. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. Look, some of us got to calm it down with the, with the praying. We, we, and I don't mean that we are praying, but I mean the manner in which we pray. Oh, great 
wonderful, awesome, totally amazing, high and lifted up, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sakura. Mm, so good. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come bowing every knee, even our eyes down before you. I bow the curls of my head down before you in homage and worship and honor and glory and down. And if I could get any lower, lowered, I would be even lower in the ground itself to make my humble, lowly, worthless request made known unto you. You know what? God doesn't need all that. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need you to quote 75 scriptures when you're praying. Who are you doing that for? The Bible says he knows what you need before you even ask. God's sitting there going, are you going to ask me for some gas money now or what? Is that what it's going to take for you to ask for some gas money? I got it for you. Just, just go ahead and ask. I got you. Look, I know you need a job. Just come to me and, and ask. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. But we want to throw out all this stuff and we want to pray in front of people. We want to use big million dollar words and all this kind of stuff. Because we're, why? We're trying to impress people again. Oh, wow, that, that person is a prayer warrior. What defines a prayer warrior? Is it how many scriptures you can quote? Is it how big the words are? Is it the amount of passion and grunting and how much talking through your teeth you can do? Because I've got all of it. Hey, and if that's your thing, that's your thing. I'm just saying. It is not a requirement. We make these things a requirement. He's like, we don't need that. Don't be like the hypocrite. For they love to pray. He's, here's their heart. They love to pray standing in front of people. They look for every opportunity to get in front of people. You ever had somebody, you, you, you might be in a, in a conversation or something like that, you're talking with them and everything, and every time somebody says something, they got something to say about it. They got something to say, and then they bring it right back to them. There was this character on Saturday Night Live. Uh, I can't remember what the character's name was, but it was played by an actress named Kristen Wiig. And it was, this, it was this character that she would do, and anytime anyone was talking about something, then she would come in and be like, you know, uh, have some story that, that kind of trumped it. You know, so somebody would be like, oh yeah, you know, I, I went down to the store today, and man, I found this great deal. I bought some apples, and they're only like 50 cents a pound. It's like, oh yeah, well, I went down to the store today, and uh, I found apples for uh, 10 cents a pound, so yeah, I just want to let you know I found them for only 10 cents. Oh man, I rushed into a, I rushed into a burning building. And I, and, I, and I saved like three people. Oh, yeah, well, you know, there was a massive earthquake and I saved 75 people, you know. I, I held up the building with my own hands. And everything they said was to try and trump or get over on, on a, 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 another person. And it's like, oh, my gosh. Look, we don't have to do that. We don't have to impress anyone. We don't have to love all that attention, standing on the corners, making big prayers and doing all these things so that they may be seen by men. Or surely I say to you, they have their reward. They have their reward. You, you said a great prayer, but guess what? God's looking at the heart. Your reward was everybody got to hear you make some really profound prayer. God's like, I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing that. I want a heart. I want a heart. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Man. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't get together and we pray for one another. We see that all throughout the Bible. But God is talking about a, a condition of the heart. If the only time you pray is when you're in a group of people and you want to be loud, but you don't have your own prayer time, then that reveals the purpose of your prayer is for people and not, and not for God. You should be having your own personal prayer time with him. Jesus goes even further. He says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Oh, boy. Anybody had those, like, 15-minute prayers? It's like, okay. Just using vain repetitions, saying the same thing over. Therefore, and look, I'm not saying all this so that every time you go to pray, you're nervous now. You're like, man, i got to keep it under 20 seconds, otherwise I'm using vain repetitions. No, remember, this is all about a matter of the heart. This is about a matter of the heart. It says, therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have needed before you ask. 
In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Very simple prayer. Acknowledging God, asking for his will, praying for others, repenting, asking for their daily needs. A simple prayer. But listen to what Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rabbit trail real quick here. Verse 14. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Of all that he just prayed in that model prayer, hallowed be your name, daily bread, all these things. What he decides to go back and emphasize and talk about is forgiveness. Forgiveness. In that whole prayer, it was just a simple line. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then he continued on. But after he's done teaching them that model prayer, he goes back and says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's another very bold black and white statement. Doesn't need much interpretation in Greek and Hebrew on that. It is what it is. He's asking us to forgive. I love, this. I love how it says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When you hold unforgiveness towards anyone, it's like demanding that someone pay you back for something that someone already took care of. So, if Aaron loaned it, loaned, lend me that $20, he lends it to me and I take it, and then, you know, Nate comes over and he says, hey, here's the $20 that Jesse owes you and pays it for me. And then Aaron is still coming after me for that $20. It's like, wait a minute. My brother Nate, out of the kindness of his heart, gave you $20 on my behalf. Why are you still coming at me? Because I want you to pay for it. I want you to suffer the loss. I don't want him to, he, he didn't do anything. And he paid it? No, I want you to suffer loss. That's what we're really saying. That's what Jesus did for us. Jesus came and he paid a debt that we owed to God. We were in debt up to our eyeballs and there was no way for us to pay it and he came and paid it on our behalf and said it is done paid in full so the devil can't come and say well you owe me this God's like "Uh uh-uh I paid for that myself get out of here well he owes me because he said no I took that I paid it so now he's saying now you do the same for others if somebody wrongs you Forgive them because God has already paid for that debt. If somebody wrongs you, God already paid for that. So you can forgive them knowing that God is already going to take care of that for you. But if you continually go after that person, telling them, well, you need to do this, you need to do this, and asking that back, you're trying to get double payment on it. And you're trying, not, what you're trying to do is not receive restoration, you're trying to receive vengeance. And your heart has now gone from One that is soft and will forgive to one that is vengeful and just wants the other person to suffer. And that's not the heart of God. So Jesus hones in on that and says, look, forgive them their trespasses. Forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, God's not going to forgive you yours. If you're going to demand a debt that was already paid, then he's going to demand it from you. Because with the same measure that we judge others, it's going to be measured back to us. We're going to see that when we get into Matthew chapter 7. So forgive those people around you. Let's move, uh, let's move forward. Verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. There's that word hypocrites again. So they're like, I'm fasting. I know I'm so holy. I'm on 700 days. <laughs> Just water. But man, I'm getting deep revelation. Deep. Look, okay, you're spiritual. We got it. You got it. You're super spiritual. Awesome. It says, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. Anytime Jesus says they have the reward, what he's saying is, is that's all you're going to get. All you're going to get is people going, wow, you're super duper spiritual. I mean, like, here's spiritual, and then here's you. I could never, oh my gosh, wow. And you're like, I know, wow. One of God's favorite. Okay, good, you got your reward. He's like, so whatever you're fasting about, it's null and void. Because this is what you really wanted. What you really wanted, what your heart's true desire was, the praises of man. So you have your reward. He says, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do it in secret, just unto the Lord. Don't be a hypocrite. Hypocrite in the Greek means to be an actor, pretender, or dissembler. In other words, hypocrite, it means you're an, you're an actor. You are pretending. You are putting on a facade. No disrespect to all the actors in here or anything like that. I'm not calling all actors a hypocrite. I'm just saying that hypocrite was used as, and you all know what I'm saying. Everybody's like, does this mean I got to turn in my SAG card? No, it doesn't. It just means that that's what it means. So when you are a hypocrite, it means that you are pretending to go for one thing, but you're actually going for something else. And it's your heart. You're trying to make it look like you're getting closer to God, but what you're really doing is trying to just get the approval and praises of men. And we understand why. I, I don't condemn anyone for wanting that because we all want to feel valued and we all want to have that, that blessing and that, and that attention. But it's whom are we looking for it from first? This is the motive of our heart. Our motives must be to please God. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, let your motives be to please God. If your motive is to please God, then you don't need all these other things. You don't need to hear the praises, the praises of man. You don't need anyone to think that you're so spiritual. You don't have to put on that facade. You don't have to act that way. And the, diff the, the hard thing about it is this is that you can do it for so long that you don't even realize you're doing it anymore. You can, you can get so good at pretending to be something that you actually become that. There was a movie um, that Jim Carrey did a long time ago. It was called um, uh, Man Over the Moon. Is that what it was? It was about that, uh, that comedian. What is it? Yeah, Man on the Moon. Andy Kaufman, thank you. And Jim Carrey was playing the role of this comedian, a famous comedian. He was on Taxi and everything. He played this role. And he got so into pretending to be this man. He, he read the lines every day. They were shooting every day. He had to go into therapy afterwards just to kind of get himself back because he spent so much time getting into this character and becoming this guy that he kind of lost himself in it and needed help coming back. Isn't that intense? That you could get so into pretending to be something that it becomes who you are and you need help coming back. I think many of us do that. We, we do that a lot in Christianity. We spend so much time trying to pretend like we're perfect and pretending and putting up these facades when things really aren't. And a lot of times, let's be honest, sometimes you're made to feel like you, you're supposed to act like that. You know, how many times you got to hear, how are you doing today? Blessed and highly favored. Blessed and highly favored. Blessed and, you know what? I am not feeling blessed and highly favored every day. And I know as a pastor, people are expecting you to have like some wonderful response followed by three or four scriptures and a word from the day that you can tweet and put on Facebook and say, oh, this is what my pastor said. You know what? Sometimes I'm just not feeling blessed and highly favored. Sometimes I'm feeling like, dude, I am wore out. I am tired. I, am, I, I need to get some sleep. I'm, you know, I've got five wonderful kids, but they're driving me crazy. You know, and I've got this to do. I've got this to do. How about you? Uh, blessed and highly favored? It's okay. We don't have to pretend we're family. We can just say what it is, and then we pray for each other, and then we move on, and that's what we do. That's what we do. But no more, no more pretending. No, I'm the, and, and look, look, if you're blessed and highly favored, then praise the Lord. We, we are blessed. 
And we are highly favored before God. But I'm just saying that just doesn't need to be the knee-jerk reaction and response every time somebody asks how you're doing. Sometimes you just need to say, uh, I'm glad you asked. I need some prayer. I'm going through it. That's it. Amen? So we want to put, lay aside hypocrisy. A lot of times when we think of hypocrisy, we think we're, we're saying one thing and then doing the opposite. Like, well, make your bed, son, and then you never make your bed. Or stop stealing, and you're over there taking stamps from the office or something like that. And while that is a, a form of hypocrisy, true hypocrisy is just pretending to be something that you're not. That's true hypocrisy according to the scriptures. You're just pretending to be something that you're not. Having wrong or hidden motives and agenda. Let's continue, verse 19. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. It almost seems like Jesus just like changes lanes here without signaling. Like one time, when he's talking about hypocrisy, and all of a sudden he says, don't lay up treasure. But this all makes sense, and we'll see. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now he's, he's still talking about your heart. Now he's still talking about what you're really going for here. He says, look, don't make your number one... Let me preface it with this. There's nothing wrong with money. Money is just a tool just like anything else. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil, according to Timothy. So money is fine. We need to get food. We need to have all that stuff. Nothing against money. You should have some. Especially if you're God's child and we have all this stuff, you should expect that God has provision for you. Amen? Okay. So we know that. But he's saying, look, don't make your life's goal and your priority obtaining worldly possessions. Because guess what? It's not going to amount to much in the end. You're not going to take it with you. The moth will eat it. Rust will destroy it. Thieves can break in and take it. And you spent all your time trying to gather these material things that have no eternal value. None at all. None. But he says, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you spend your time, your talent, your uh, everything worrying about and trying to gather up treasure for here on earth, that reveals where your heart really is. If your heart is really on this earth, then you will spend all your time and your attention and your focus trying to obtain while you're here. He says, but if your heart is in heaven, you'll lay up treasure in heaven because you have an eternal perspective and you're looking to your Father and not to this world to please you. I want to please God. That means if I don't have all the things that everybody else has while I'm, I'm here, that's fine because it's passing away anyway. This is so temporal. I'm 37 years old now and I look at my children and I'm like, man, I remember when I was that age. It's going like this. It's a vapor and gone. Why spend all that time trying to build up all this stuff when it's just going to be gone? And then when you're gone, it just goes to somebody else. It's like, I want my treasure in heaven where it's eternal. When I walk in, they're like, man, I maybe didn't have all this stuff down here. But when I get up there, I'm like, oh, check this out. God hooked it up. I laid up some good treasure up here. I'm like, thanks, God. I give him that holy high five when I walk up there. I'm like, thank you. That's, that's what I want to hear from God. We've got we to get away from the instant gratification and look towards our eternal promise that we have in God. Amen? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22, he says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. You're like, oh man, Jesus is getting deep. Ever, anybody ever read this scripture? And you're like, oh, that's good. And then you're like, okay, now what on earth is he talking about? Raise your hand and be honest. Okay, good. Thank you. Everybody, like, I was reading that. I was like, I need to read that three or four more times. I'm like, the light, I'm going to explain it to you. It says, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The lamp of the body is the eye. That word lamp right there means candlestick. And the, and the notion there is that you use a candlestick in order to light your way. So 
your, your eye is the lamp of the body. So wherever your eye goes, that's where you follow. So he's saying, your eye, whatever you look at, whatever you put your attention on, that's what you're going to follow. Just the way you take a lamp and you shine it in the direction where you're going to go. So is your eye. So whatever you're looking at, whatever you're going for, that gives the direction of your life. Of your life. So the lamp of the body is the eye. So your, where your eye goes, your, your body is going to follow. If therefore your eye is good, so your eye is focused on those things that are good, your whole body will be full of light because you're going in the right direction. But he says, if your eye is dark and focused on darkness and you're going after material things, then how great is that darkness? Why is it so great? Because in the end, you're going to realize it was all for nothing anyway. What a great disappointment and regret. Have you ever gotten anything material in this world and thought that it was going to be everything and you were going to be so excited only to find out that the gratification lasted that long and now you're looking for something else? Whether it be a relationship or the, the latest iPhone. Like, oh, iPhone 75 is coming out. Well, what was wrong with iPhone 74? Well, on this one, it's a little bit bigger. Well, didn't they just make it a little bit bigger and then make it a little bit smaller? Yeah, but this one's smaller, smaller. And then the next one's going to be even bigger. It's like, oh my gosh, really? They got us so hooked. Like, oh, I got to get the new one. And then you get it, and then like two weeks later, you're like, uh, when's, the new, when's the new thing coming out? Uh, we are so easily, you know, uh, disenchanted by these things. So it says, look, focus on those things that are good. Your whole body will be full of light. But if the direction of your life, if what you put in your eye on, if what you're putting your focus on is darkness, you're going to be very disappointed. Listen to what he says in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. You can't be going in this direction and going in this direction at the same time. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. He says you can't serve two masters. This is what happens when, in human beings a, a lot of times. When your heart starts being drawn away to something else, what automatically happens is, whatever your heart is with currently, you begin to hate it. It's not enough just to be drawn away. You have to despise it in order to justify your leaving. So what you do is, is you look for fault, and you will create fault in that thing where your heart was in order to justify your heart going on to something else. That's why you'll be love the one or hate the other. He didn't say love one and just kind of walk away from the other. Your heart starts getting drawn away. And so you have to create this picture of this evil thing because you want to go over here. You want to be drawn away to this other thing. So it says you will, either, you will hate the one and love the other or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Wow. Of all the things for the Lord Jesus to compare God to or say there's two things to serve, he says God and mammon. Mammon just means money, riches. You can't serve both. Your heart is either going to go towards one or it's going to go towards the other. That's what he's saying here. Well, does that mean that I can't have money? No. It just means that that can't be your goal. It means that if you are making a decision and the purpose and the heart behind that decision is to obtain greater riches or wealth or material things, then that is not a good motive. Your heart is going towards the wrong thing. You, we don't pursue provision, we pursue purpose and provision comes. When you pursue the heart of God, He provides the provision. But if all you do is pursue the provision and the finances, maybe you'll obtain it, you probably will, but you miss out on everything that God has for you. And the Bible says, what is it for a man to obtain the whole world, yet lose his soul? Remember, you cannot go in two directions. You cannot go in two directions. You have to choose one. Choose God or choose mammon. Why did Jesus choose mammon of all the things? It's because money represents such a huge part of our life. It is, it is a very representation of our time and our life and our value and what we put that into. You can look at someone's bank statement and see where their heart is where they put their time and energy into. You can see it. It's right there. In mine, my heart is at, you know, target, 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 tithe, offering, target, 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 bonds, target, target. Target's got a lot of my heart. That's where we go shopping for a lot of stuff. So you would think I'm worshiping target. 
But no, but when you can, you can look at somebody's bank account and see where their heart is going. What are the types of purchases that you're making? What are the things that you are investing your time and finances into? It's revealing. It lets you know. So how do you serve God and how do you serve mammon? Look at verse 25. This is the key. It says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. I'm going to read through this, uh, the whole rest of this passage here. And just listen to what he says. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if, the God, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. How many times did he say worry? He said it five times. You know, you know how you serve God and, uh, or serve mammon? through what you worry about. Worry is a form of worship. Worry is a form of worship. Worship basically mean, it means to bow down. When you worry about something, you are bowing down and you are stressed because you believe that that thing you are worrying about has power over you. That is worship. When you worry, you are worshiping something. If you're worrying about money, you're worshiping it. You're worrying about this person and what they think about you? You are worshiping them. You're worshiping them. Jesus has laid it out here. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. And when he was speaking this, there was no big space, new verse, title caption over the new... F that wasn't there in the Bible when Jesus was talking. There was no gap there. It wasn't like he took a five-minute break. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry was his next words. Worrying is a form of worship. You want to know who your master is? What are you worried about? What do you put your time into thinking about and making sure it goes right? Are you concerned about the things of God? Or are you more concerned about things of the world? And here's, here's the thing. He says, look, I know you have need of all these things. But he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are going to be added. If you worry about money and everything, maybe you get it, maybe you don't. But if you worry about the things of God and consider him, he says, I'm going to give it to you anyway. So now you have God and the blessing. But over here, you may receive what you consider a blessing, those material things, but then without God, there's no peace. Can you think of somebody who has all the material things that they want, but they have no peace? They are stressed, they are worried, even those who would take their own lives. Yet they have everything. Everything that we think we want. Fame, fortune. They got a million likes on Facebook, but they don't love themselves because they never received the love of the Father. They pursued the wrong thing. They made material things their master. And that master always disappoints. That master never delivers. That master always disappoints. It's not worth it to serve that master. It's not worthy, worth it to worry about those things. We're not built to worry and serve money. Money is designed to serve us. The money we have should serve God and His purposes and serve us, but we spend too much time trying to serve it. And we just got to flip it. It's just a simple switch. It's like, oh... God knows I need this, and he said he'll provide. So I'm going to worry about his things, and then he'll take care of that. 
means you've got to trust Him. It means that you have to trust the Lord. Turn to Proverbs 3 real quick. We talked about the motives that Jesus spoke on. We talked about the Master and how we serve them. I want to talk now about the money because the Lord brings it up here. Proverbs chapter 3. And we'll start at verse 1. It says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. Remember, it's about a heart. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. See, there's nothing wrong with mankind holding you in high esteem, but it has to be in the sight of God first and then man. Please God, and he said he will exalt you. He will lift you up. Nothing wrong with it. It just has to be in the right order. Nothing wrong with money. It just has to be in the right order. Let's get everything in the right order, he's saying. And you will find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in Him. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Don't try and figure everything out on, by yourself. Don't do it. My son, uh, Justice, asked me this morning when we were getting out of the car. He's like, Dad, is it true? That humans only use about 10% of your, their brain? I was like, I don't know, that's what they say. He's like, what would it be like if we would use 100% of our brain? I was like, we'd be dead. Does that mean that we would have to control our heartbeat and our breathing and we'd forget? And we'd die. <laughs> we couldn't do it. So don't lean on your own understanding. You only use 10% of your brain anyhow. You can't even beat your own heart. So let's, let's lean on God. He's the one taking care of that anyway. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Listen to this, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Everybody say honor. Honor. Honor, honor. honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. There's a little plug right there. He said, honor. Honor the Lord. We have turned finances in the church into a big business. And I don't like that. But I don't want it to deter us from doing what's right with our finances as well. We have to have a balance. Yes, there have been people who abuse it and misuse it and try and manipulate and talk you out of your finances and try and do all these things. But it is also true that it is a reflection of our heart towards God and our obedience to Him and our level of trust in Him. This is why He asked us to give of the tithe. I want to talk a little bit about the tithe. The tithe, and this is in your, your message notes there, the tithe is not a forced investment that guarantees a return. This is how the tithe is presented a lot. The tithe is not a forced investment that guarantees a return. That's kind of, kind of how it's presented. You know, you've robbed God in tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse. Isn't it interesting how all curses have been forgiven in the modern day church, except when you don't give your money to the church? <laughs> now you're cursed. Oh, don't worry about it. God will forgive you. God will forgive you. You didn't give your tithe. You cursed. And we will preach that all the time from the pulpit. You cursed with a curse. You know, Malachi 3.10 and all that. I did a whole teaching on that. You can go on YouTube and find it. I won't get back into that, but that was, that was not, it's not what it's presented as in the church most of the time. It's much deeper than that. But it's not a forced uh, investment strategy. That's the way it's like, hey, give to God, he's going to give right back. The motive of the heart is not to give to get. If you're ever in a place where you're giving to get, that's the wrong heart. Your motive is wrong because you're, now you're trying to get something. It happens all the time. God is not a vending machine. This is how a vending machine works. I take my change and I put it in and then I press what I want and then I get it out. 
That's the way we treat God, especially when it comes to tithes and offerings. Well, I've been given my tithe. Here's my tithe. Here's my tithe. Here's my tithe. Now I want my new car. Do, 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 do. What happens when a vending machine doesn't give you what he wants? You pick it up and you shake it and you're like kicking it and we're doing that to God. God, why haven't you given me my car? I've been given my tithe. Oh, you want more? What? God took my money. God took my money. That machine took my money and didn't give me what I wanted. This thing doesn't work. And that's how we treat tithing. It's become a give to get. When we give to the Lord, it's not because we're trying to get something. It's because we've already received something. I've already received. What, what more can I ask of God than eternal life in heaven with Him forever? Even if I was to suffer from the day I was born to the day I died here and I have eternity in heaven, wouldn't that be worth it? Anything else that I receive on this planet is a blessing to me. I have eternity. I don't give my tithe. I do tithe. People say, well, do you have to because it's the law? That's, that's besides the point. I want to. He's given so much to me. The tithe precedes the law, by the way. The tithe didn't just come in in the Mosaic law. In uh, Genesis chapter 14, you say Abraham is the first time the tithe is mentioned. When he went and he battled the five kings and rescued his, his, uh, his nephew uh, Lot and the, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in that battle, he, he took his, his trained servants and wiped out three kingdoms, which is him and his boys, and rescued his nephew. And on his way back from, from, uh, from the battle, he stopped by Salem, where there was a, a priest and king named Melchizedek. And he gave him a tithe of everything that he had. It wasn't because he had to. It's because Melchizedek represented the God Most High. And when he saw him, he said, the Lord gave me favor today. And he gave him a tithe of all. It was a place of honor. It wasn't like, oh, the guy gave me this, now I've got to give him a tithe. No, you've already blessed me. I'm doing this as a sign of honor to you. You have given me so much. I want everyone to know that it was a God most high who delivered those kings into my hand. And it is him and him alone who deserves the attention. So he gave him a tithe of all, 10% of the increase. And he gave that back to the Lord to the king and priest Melchizedek. It was a place of honor. No one told him he had to do it. There was something inside his spirit that says, this is what I do to honor my God. This is how I let everyone know and keep my flesh in check and make sure that they know that I serve God and not mammon. I give it freely of my own will. So it's not about whether you have to or not. That's the law and that's behavior. Grace is what we're under. And now we do it because we want to. I have received, therefore I give. I don't give to receive. That would be ridiculous. And make sure you're not doing that in other areas of your life either. You know, marriages, don't don't play that game. Don't play play the game of give to get. Husbands, if you're taking your wife out on a date and everything so you can get some later on, don't do that. Can I be honest? She knows what you're doing. Don't do it. How about, how about you, you, you take your wife out and, and bless her just because she already said yes to marry you behind? You know? I mean, I love my wife. I, she doesn't have to do anything for me. She said yes to me. You know, she had, there was a lot of people who wanted to marry my wife. She had like people, literally, I'm like, there were people like lining up who wanted to marry my wife. I'm like, dang. I was like, well, okay, this dude's asking me. This one said God said marry her and all this stuff. I'm like, wow, man. But thank God my wife was a softball player. She, always, she was taught, you know, you never swing at the first pitch. She waited for the right one, and then bam, home run. Right, babe? Yeah. Post that on Facebook. Let those other guys say, dang. Shoot. They got five kids, too? Man. Yep, eat your heart out. What the heck was I talking about? <laughs> Tithing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, give to get. Give to get. That's right. That's right. Give to get. So I've already been blessed with my wife. I don't need, I, I give her just because she's a blessing, you know. God has already given to me. He's blessed me with eternal life. He's blessed me with my wife. He's blessed me with my children. What can I, I withhold from him? I want to give everything back to him. And every time I do, he just keeps giving more. I'm like, dang, God. He's like, I know, it's like that. And wait till you, you don't even know. Wait till you get up here and you see what I have for you. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you. I prepare a place for you. You have no idea. Paul says this. He says, I tell you, 
that the sufferings that we endure in this time aren't even worthy to be mentioned when we compare them to the glory that awaits us. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding? God, take everything I have. Take my shoes. Take everything. I don't care. I've got eternity waiting for me, and it's better than what I can imagine. Are you kidding me? What am I going to hold back? What am I going to let Lord over my life? What other master am I going to serve? Mammon's not going to do that for me. I've seen what it does to other people. I'm going to make sure that everything in me honors the Lord. So we honor the Lord with our giving. We honor the Lord with our money and our, and our, and our finances. The tithe is not a forced investment that guarantees a return. It is a seed of honor with the promise of a harvest. It's not an investment strategy. It is a harvest. You see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. We honor the Lord. And when we honor the Lord, we demonstrate our heart towards Him and we make sure that He is Master and no one or nothing else. So let's check our motives. Let's make sure we're serving the right master. And let it even be demonstrated even in our finances. Simply because that is something that is a great indicator in our life. And that is why Jesus used that example in his Sermon on the Mount. That's why he mentioned mammon. Because there's such a great opportunity for it to come in and try and weasel its way in and disguise itself as a godly thing. But it's really not. It's just trying to take that. So make sure that God has his proper place in your heart. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not be pretending to be one way, but then being something completely different. We have the freedom to be open and honest with God, and He loves and accepts you just the way you are. Praise God for His grace and mercy. Praise God He paid the price, and our debts have been paid by Him. Praise the Lord for that. That is worth serving Him. That is a master I want to serve, a master that loves and has my best interest at heart. I gladly serve him. I'm gladly called a bond servant to the Lord. I could be free, but I choose not to be because freedom from him is no life at all. Amen. We just want to make sure